And, and what was Burt Lancaster like? You notice I wore my special J.J. Hunsaker glasses tonight just for the occasion. <laughs> what was, what was Bert's he like? Burt's great. There's not, nobody like Burt Lancaster. He is very powerful, very charismatic. And uh, I couldn't have asked for a better person to work with. Nice. And, and did you get the sense that when they were making this film, did they think that they were doing something that was going to uh, be like a, a bomb drop or something? I mean, Burt Lancaster is essentially playing Walter Winchell in this movie. And uh, much like you saw you know, Harry Cohn's reaction to The Big Knife, you can easily imagine that you're making this film and it's like, wow, how are they going to react to this? We're not really making the powers that be in, in the, the newspaper business looked too good in this film. Was there any concern about what the reaction was going to be? Well, I think it was an artistic venture and that it was treated in, as such by, by the participants. Uh, I'm sure there was an awareness of everything you say, but you know we were making a movie and uh, pretty gung-ho about it. And as far as dropping a bomb is concerned, of course you want to drop a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was the point, wasn't it? Uh, and, and was there any reaction that you're aware of when the film really didn't do that well in the box office? It did not really take off. It got very good critical reactions, but it just is one of those things where it seemed like the public did not really want to see Burt Lancaster and Tony. They wanted to see them in trapeze. They did not want to see them uh, playing these characters on the screen, it seemed. And were you aware of the aftermath of the film? Well, you win some, you lose some, I'm sure. They were often running to their next uh, thing, and um, I think they always were comfortable that it was a success as far as the, the project being good. Everybody thought it was good, and if the public didn't like it, that's just the breaks, I guess. However, it turned out to be a, a winner in certain ways, anyway. Yeah. And, and are you aware of that? I mean, from the time you made this film up till now, have you followed the, uh, th this film's growing reputation? I mean, 40 years ago, this was considered to be, wow, kind of an interesting film and, and somewhat marginal. And now I really think its reputation has grown to the point where for me personally, I look at this film as uh, one of the key films in American cinema because it so captures the transition between America and American media and culture in the 1940s. And, and it's like right here, this nails the 50s and the whole change in music and the jazz element of this film. And it just, it, it predicts the 1960s. And it, it's like a, a key film in American cinema to me. And are you, have you been aware of that over the years? Well, the sweet smell of success certainly became uh, an idiomatic phrase in our <coughs> culture. Actually, Burt Lancaster himself is the one who told me, I guess it was about 20 years later, sometime in the mid-70s, I was having a meeting with him, and he told me <coughs> that uh, all of it was said about it. He's the one who... You mean he felt the same way? <laughs> well, he said, no, you know what? This is, um, I, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he's the one who told me that it actually was a success in this way. In, in the long run, over time. In the long run, yeah. over time. Yeah. And so what's, what's your feeling about it? When, you, when was the last time you saw this film? It has been quite some years, I would say, yeah. And when you last saw it, or when you will see it tonight, I wish I was asking this question after you've seen the film, but when you see yourself on the screen, do you are you able to see the character you're playing, or do you just see yourself, or, or what, what does it mean to you when, you when you see this? Well, I see it in the movie. Actually, although I, I really like the creative process, and I usually mostly just remember the rehearsals and creating a, a part in a character, I kind of remember this as having really happened. So it's just a little different in that way to me. And actually, each time I've seen it, this might be the third to fourth time, it gets more, I like it better, you know, because the personal distance is 
farther away or I'll notice things I didn't notice before. At first, I thought it was boring, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, probably that's because I was kind of trying to hide and everything. But they say time heals all wounds. And certainly time has gone by. So. <laughs> Well, I have to ask you about a couple other things in your career. Uh, I was just talking to your son over here a moment ago, and he mentioned a film that is, is somewhat of a little lost film. It's very intriguing uh, by a favorite director of mine, Phil Carlson. A, a film called Key Witness that you were in uh, that I'd love to find and show here someday. Uh, do you remember that picture? Yeah, it, it's interesting. I don't know if anybody has seen this film, but it's it's one of those kind of uh, juvenile delinquent gang pictures. Susan actually plays a member of the gang. I think you're Dennis Hopper's uh, girlfriend, in fact, in that film. And uh, you know, they they uh, they're, they're a, a husband with a family man witnesses a stabbing on the street and by his gang, and then they find out where he lives and terrorize the family. And you were Ruby in that film, and there's like a song that plays throughout the entire film. It's like your your theme song, and it's pretty haunting. Uh, but interesting, do you have any recollections of making that film? What? And tell me, was Dennis Hopper bizarre? <laughs> well, he's not really biz bizarre. He has potent characteristics. <laughs> <laughs> Inspiring himself to do things. <laughs> wow, that is the best answer I could have possibly asked for. Potent characteristics and methods for inspiring himself. I will remember that. Um, and how about Phil Carlson as a director? Oh, I appreciate him so much. Wonderful. He's a wonderful director. Um, oops, I'm so sorry. I'm not really used to it. Um, this is what I think, if my memory serves me correctly, a couple of days after that film, it's a, it's a Metro Goldwyn Mayer Pando Berlin production, and it had everything going for it. Uh, a couple of days after that film came out, I heard it on the news driving in the car. Some young gang member got up in the theater and shot and killed another gang member as if inspired or incited by that movie, which uh, caused them to pull it. And uh, for deca uh, decades later, it began showing here and there on television or something like that. But initially, it just really, it kind of broke its ankle coming out of the gate there, so. And that, and that was 1960, so the, uh, the gang shooting in the theaters uh, concept is nothing uh, all that new, it sounds like. <laughs> no. now, now, here's a piece of trivia for you. The fellow who edited this movie tonight, Sweet Smell of Success, was also the director of an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents that you did a few years later. Do you recall that? I know. Uh, was it later? Uh, yeah, it, uh, it's sometime in the 1960s. It was it was called, I think, the, the gloating place. Or oh something. yes, yeah. that was the first job I ever had. Really? I was very young. That was back in New York. I, oh no, maybe it was when I first came out here. Yeah, the gloating place, and I played a murderess. <laughs> and my little sister said to me, oh, Susie, I have nightmares when I see you doing that on TV. <laughs> so, I guess that's quite a compliment. Yes, I thought it was, but I did think of, her, of giving my poor sister nightmares for, for that. And one other fabulous piece of trivia from your career. This is the one I want you to take home with you tonight. You may not know this. But you were one of the stars of one of the more memorable episodes of The Twilight Zone, uh, an episode, I think, called Five Characters in Search of an Exit. Okay. And, and uh, do you recall that episode? I'm sure you do, with Wayne Windham and a few other people. Uh, <laughs> there are fans, they know this episode. Were you aware that that show is the basis for Bob Dylan's song, All Along the Watchtower. <laughs> I'm giving you real trivia tonight. 
vaudeville. That, that, that Bob Dylan, that, that episode of that show is the, is the reason Bob Dylan wrote the song All Along the Watchtower. So oh. next time you hear Jimi Hendrix do it, think of Susan Harrison. <laughs> well, hey, right? no, but I'm glad you told me so I can dig on it. You know? <laughs> exactly. So people think it was a profound comment on the 1960s, and it was actually a profound comment on the Twilight Zone. <laughs> See, that was the thing. So, Susan, are you ready to watch this movie again? Oh, I'm looking forward to it for one of the first times. I'm not even afraid, and I'm just looking forward to it. <laughs> I want you to give a big round of applause to Susan Harris. <laughs>